the question is asked often, why are we even going to Mars? How can we create a new civilization that will function harmoniously? So if we want to form a functioning civilization out there, what is it built on? Well, a solid society is built on respect, ethics, and trust. As an airline pilot and flight instructor, Jim Mountain began his teaching career in the cockpit of an airplane. He received his pilot's license on his 16th birthday and flew before he could drive. So his dad drove him to the airport with full confidence his mother was his first passenger. Oh. <laughs> with a married background, what a brave woman. <laughs> With a varied background as a journalist and college instructor, instructor, he continues to keynote conferences worldwide. Public television produced an eight-part series on his work entitled, Reaching New Heights of Excellence. Last September, Jim was featured speaker at the 20th Annual International Mars Society Convention at the University of California in Irvine. His passion for space exploration led him to author his latest book, Red Planet Leadership, which offers a design for a new culture. He holds a PhD in management and knows that we teach best what we need to learn most. And now, Destination Mars, the first in a series on how to create a sustainable and civil civilization, the subject of his research for the past many years. So at this time, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Milton. Thank you very much, honey. I appreciate that very much, very much. So, hello. Why, why the title? Destination Mars, flight 2024. Very simple. Did you know that in just six years, we are sending the first humans to Mars to begin colonizing the red planet? And the Curiosity rover, which was a design by JPL, uh, is in fact on Mars at the moment. JPL was faced with the challenge of landing a one-ton, $2.6 billion vehicle on the surface of Mars. And because of the sensitivity and the delicateness of the machinery, the instrumentation, it had to make an extremely soft feather landing. Let's take a look at how this landing actually occurred. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long, and then gently deposit it on its wheels on the surface. As the rover touches down and is now on the ground, the descent stage it's in a collision course with a rover. We must cut the bridle immediately and fly to the same stage to a safe distance from the rover. So the question is asked often, why are we even going to Mars? I mean, what, why are we doing this? How can we form a functioning uh, civilization out there when we don't have our own house in order here? How can we create a new civilization that will function harmoniously? The simple solution is take the best and leave the worst behind. So if we want to form a functioning civilization out there, what is it built on? Well, a solid society is built on respect, ethics, and trust. We know that. All right. And when is this formed? Ask any psychologist or psychiatrist, and they will tell you that we form our beliefs and values by the age of seven, eight, nine, 
something around those years. My friend Ron is a consummate teacher, and he was going to, he lives in Prescott, Arizona, and he was going to the bank one day, and Jason, his son, wanted to go with him. So he said, okay, get in the car. So they got in the car, and they drove to the bank. And Ron said, stay right here, Jason, I'll be right back. So Jason walked it, watched his dad walk into the bank through the glass doors, walk up to the teller, give the teller a check. The teller gave Ron the money, he counted it, and he walked back to the, in, the, in the bank. Halfway to the door, he stopped, <coughs> pulled the money out of his pocket, counted it again with a perplexed look on his face, and put the money back in his pocket and went in the back outside to the car. And when he got in the car, Jason looked up at me and he said, what's wrong, Dad? He said, son, we have, we have a problem. The teller has given me $100 more than she should have. We have an ethical dilemma, and I need your help. Should we or should we not tell your mother? <laughs> well, you have to realize that our, our formative years are early, and uh, many adults, maybe some here today, are functioning in ideas that we formed when we were children. I ran across a book called The Red Planet when I was a kid, and I picked it up at um, Hempel Bookstore in Milwaukee. I think it was about a dollar or a dollar and a half, hardcover no less back in the early 50s. I picked up another book by Warner Van Braun, the master of the V2 rocket. It's called The Mars Project. I never opened it to read it before I bought it, but uh, when I did, I realized it was far beyond my pay grade. Uh, <laughs> let me move forward to another visionary, Dr. Robert Zubrin. He is a prolific writer and author of The Case for Mars, which is a guide to take us to the red planet. And many people are using that particular book at this moment. Uh, let me give you a little better picture of uh, Robert when he's a little more relaxed. <laughs> this was at the 20th Annual International Mars Society Convention where I was privileged to have been a featured speaker. We had a tour of the JPL lab it's a phenomenal place. It, it's like it's science fiction, but it's actually reality. And Zubrin says, it is time for the humans to travel to Mars. He says, though, though Mars is distant, we are far better prepared today to send humans to Mars than we were to travel to the moon at the commencement of the space age. When was that, by the way? This is called audience response. When was that? 69? 51, 61, 1957. What happened in 57? Does anybody know? Yeah, yeah, Sputnik, exactly. Uh, we wanted to go to the moon, but what really got us off the launch pad was when Russia sent that 23-inch sphere circling the globe, scared the screaming bejeebers out of us. We wanted to go to the moon, and we wanted space superiority, but knew we, we knew we were desperately lagging behind. All right, uh, what I'm saying here is we have ingenuity as a country, and we applied it. And when it came to the moon, the leadership got it. Let's take a, a quick look at John Kennedy. Now, May 25, 1961, he was addressing Congress, and he had, um, he had made a civilization-changing statement that is more powerful than most people realize, and I want you to hear this one. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space 
and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Ladies and gentlemen, those were not words. That was a vision. And when you capture a vision for your personal life, your community, Dusty Wings, your charity, your nation, people will rally behind you to the ends of the earth and beyond to help you reach your dream. But if you don't have a vision, people will continually meander on through your path, preventing you from reaching any end whatsoever. The best picture we had of Mars in 1937 was this and a quote by Plato about 2,500 years ago. Astronomy compels the soul to look upward and leads us to this world to another. Was he talking about Mars? I don't know. This was taken 40 years ago. It's a mosaic composite by the Viking One Orbiter with some updates in 2003. So let's really quickly get into a few facts about Mars, very quickly. Mars is half the diameter of the Earth. One Mars day, they call it a soul. It's uh, 24 hours and 39 minutes. It's one third the gravity of Earth. The average temperature is about minus 81. It can get down to 243 below, and sometimes it gets up to 70 degrees in the, in the daytime. Depends on the season. But seasons are double time because it's an elliptical orbit. You don't have to remember any of this stuff. There's no test. And contrary to popular belief, there is water on Mars. Mars has two small moons, Deimos and Phobos, and they think they're broken off asteroids from the asteroid belt, and this has one of the tallest mountains in the solar system, so we think. It's called Olympus Mons. It's about three times the size of Mount Everest, and the base of it is right around the size of Texas. So, let's move forward just a little bit to June 28th, 1971, Elon Musk was born, formed PayPal, formed Tesla, formed Solar City, and he created SpaceX. He's only 47 years of age. Well, great companies know exactly where they're going. And the last sentence in his mission statement for SpaceX is to create a self-sustaining human civilization on Mars. And he makes no bones about it. He said, the reason I formed SpaceX is to colonize Mars. Listen to what he said. If you, if you build a ship that's capable of going to Mars, well, well, what if you take that same ship and go from one place to another on Earth? So we, we looked at that, and the results are quite interesting. Let's take a look at that. Seventeen thousand miles an hour. Going from LA to Shanghai here in thirty-nine minutes. Not bad. Okay. Well, let's see where else we can go. Los Angeles, Toronto, twenty-four minutes. Los Angeles, New York, twenty-five minutes. Bangkok. You can't even serve coffee. <laughs> Long distance trips, less than 30 minutes. And anywhere on Earth in under an hour. You talk about technology. Our world is moving so fast nowadays, it's a bit difficult to keep up with it. We put men and machinery on the moon and nearby planets. We've got submarines that'll dive to the ocean floors. Our, our, our Computers can solve some of the most complex problems of life in literally seconds. And we're still faced with a dilemma. 
which if not handled will plague us into the future of our children and the future of our grandchildren. And the dilemma is simple, how to keep people paced with technology to enhance the human experience. I think we've got technology kind of put to bed. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be complacent about it, but I think technology is cool. It's the people who need the help. A lot of it has to do with communication. So let me digress just a little bit from Mars to the people actually going to make it happen. What we're talking about here is communication. Uh, I mean, imagine yourself in a, in a tuna can, uh, seven months going to Mars, uh, and you have a communication breakdown. You can't pick up your marbles and walk out. It's not possible. You're going to have to find a resolution. Let's say you're on Mars. Uh, for a year and a half or two years until the cycle comes around where the window of opportunity returns for you to go back and you have a communication breakdown. You can't just walk away from the situation because the people with whom you're with are responsible for your life. In my book, um, Red Planet Leadership, I outlined uh, some of the critical issues to make communication crystal clear. And we're going to talk about five of those issues right now, very quickly. All right. Communicate clearly. Uh, it was in August that I was asked by a Disney Corporation to give a program for their people. And uh, they felt this topic was so important that they live streamed it to Atlanta, Seattle, Orlando, and Paris, France. And they, uh, guess, guess what the topic was? Enhanced team communication. Now, can you imagine a corporation as successful as Disney wanting to learn more about how to communicate effectively? I know you believe you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. <laughs> I mean, my friend George Shapiro is a professor at the University of Minneapolis, uh, Mi University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And he did a study and found out that only 7% of what is conveyed, conversed, is heard through words. All right, you mathematicians, if 7% is heard, that means that, nine, thank you, 93% is not heard through words. 38% is conveyed through the feeling, the intonation, the tone behind the word, and 55% of who I am today is coming to you live through body signals. Lee Iacocca, you heard of him, I'm sure. He's not doing as much now as he used to as far as speaking, but his statements ring true. He said, there's one thing I hate to see on any individual's evaluation. No matter how talented the guy is, and that's the line, he has trouble getting along with people. He said, to me, that's the kiss of death. You just destroyed the guy, because that's all we've got around here. No dogs, no apes, just people. And if he can't get along with his peers, what good is he to the company? And I thought to myself, yeah, attitude plays a key role. What kind of an attitude did you get up with this morning? With the glass half full? from last night, or the glass half empty <laughs> uh, with a positive approach to today or a negative approach to today. Looking for the opportunities or looking for the challenges or where do I hurt today? I mean, what do we say about this? I mean, some people get up and they say, good morning, God. Others get up and say, good God, <laughs> it's morning. <laughs> so how do you get up? I want to talk about the SIP principle just a second. Uh, but I need a victim, a vo volunteer. I need a, I need a volunteer. Just one to come right up here. Anybody. Uh, not all of you at once. Just anybody at all. Anybody. There you go. Let's give her a hand. Come on, Gail. Thank you, my love. Thank you. Gail Crater. Here she is. <laughs> okay. Um, how many of you know Gail? Okay. How many of you would like to know Gail? She's a great gal. 
you look at she volunteered to come up here. I'm not going to put you on the spot. Okay. I'm just going to share a few things and I'm going to ask you one question at the end and your answer will determine whether you live or die. So <laughs> there is absolutely no, no pressure here at all. Okay, let's say that after this program you received a call from your very best friend and you've known this person all of your life. You've gone to school with them, you've shared lunch with them, you've worked with them and they called you up and said, Gail, I've been thinking about you for the last couple of days. I felt compelled to call you. I don't want to borrow any money. I don't want to ask any favors. I just want to let you know, for some reason or other, I can't put it any other way than this. Whenever I'm with you, I always feel good about myself and I'm so pleased I can call you my friend. How would you feel? I feel happy. Let's give her a hand. By the way, <laughs> hang on, hang on. Matthew deserves a book, Red Planet Leadership, and uh, it's a great book. I read it myself. Th thank you so much. So if you got that call, how would you feel? You'd feel fine, fine, super fine. I asked one guy, he said, like they got the wrong number. <laughs> no, you'd feel fine, super fine. You'd be on cloud nine. If you were a doctor and you just received that telephone call and you walked back into the hospital, do you suppose you'd be a better doctor? Probably. If you were a teacher and you walked right back into the classroom after that call, wouldn't you take a little more time with those little kids? You probably would. If you were a flight attendant, wouldn't you be a little more patient, possibly, with the passengers? But riddle me this. <laughs> <laughs> What more would you know about being a doctor, a teacher, or a flight attendant? Probably nothing. We're dealing with principles here. The principle of gravity. When I step off the top of a building, I go down, not up. When I jump out of an airplane and I pull a ripcord and the chute doesn't open, that's the Packer's problem, and he's got one. Whenever I misuse the law, I lose, and whenever I try to get Without giving, I lose. The SIP principle is simple. Self-image equals performance. Whenever you raise the opinion you have of yourself, you raise the level of your performance. Whenever you lower the opinion you have of yourself, you lower the level of your performance. And it all operates by law, and there's not that much allowance for ignorance. So why even bother going to Mars? Often people don't connect the frontier of the new science research with what, what could transform their lives in the future. We hear people say things like, why are we spending so much money going to the moon and Mars when we, we could use that right here on Earth? We have too many problems right here. That lack of vision is so short-sighted, it could be the demise of our very existence. I was in um, San Francisco. I was doing a program with Catherine Thornton. Many of you know she's an astronaut, and she was up in the Endeavour uh, flight for quite a, quite a few times doing optic repairs for the Hubble telescope. And we were doing a program called Make Your Future Now, and she was talking about spin-off technology. Side note, her, her, her um, husband, Steve, was there. He's a <laughs> nuclear physicist. And she did her doctoral work in light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, laser beams. I can't imagine what their breakfast conversation is like. <laughs> but she had some great ideas on spin-off technology. So let me give you just a few examples here on why we can go and everything that we do to go to Mars, we can use here. Hydrogen, oxygen, rocket engines, space rendezvous technology, deep space navigation and communication, the ability to soft land on the moon, spaceships. I know you say, okay, we'll bring it home. I will. How about this? Computer enhancements, iPods, iPhones, silicon chips, cell phones, new treatments for osteoporosis, and you can bet if it's cordless, fireproof, waterproof, lightweight, strong, miniaturized, and automated. NASA probably had a hand in it. We're talking about trash compactors, bulletproof vests, solar panels, artificial limbs, implantable heart monitors, and GPS technology. That's only a minor sample of what's going on out there. And Mars spin-off technology 
will be evident sooner rather than later. All right, let's move to one other element here which has to do with listening because if we're going to form a spacefaring civilization, we'll need to listen to other people. It's obviously important, but we'll, we need to listen with concern. Listen behind what you hear the other person feeling, and often, often we don't do that. We only hear with our ears, but we listen with our minds. So when we're giving someone attention, can you tell when you have someone's attention? Can you tell when you don't? Do you think it works the other way around? Yeah, it sure it does. When someone asks you about your children, what are they waiting for you to ask them? <laughs> about their children. When someone asks you where you traveled on your vacation, what are they burning inside to share with you? Where they went. When someone asks you what you do for a living, what do they want to boast to you? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Listening is a critical ingredient. All right. Another point is observe. We need to look around. We need to elevate our senses. Elevate our senses to the point where, uh, where we, we're not using our eyes, but we're using our internal senses. Because again, we only see with our eyes, but we observe with our senses. And every once in a while, you meet someone. And instantly, without even thinking about it, you know that you hate them. You know, or, 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 or that you love them, you know? You know, thing, things are going around. And we respond to what we see. We, we do this. Maxwell Maltz wrote the book Psycho-Cybernetics years ago, and they still use that program in, in the college market. And uh, he said, uh, experimental and clinical psychologists have proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that your mind cannot tell the difference between something seen visually and physically and something imagined vividly and in detail. Can't tell the difference. That says to me that you can start playing some games with your mind. You can start impressing what you want to express and you can start thinking about what you want to come about. Join me in a little experiment, please. Take your thumb and index finger and make a circle of it. Now just do it. Now put it up to your eye and look around. You've been wanting to anyway. <laughs> okay, now put it over your head, way over your head. All right, now start shaking it. Can you all see me? You see? Bring it straight on down, right on down to your chin. On your chin. This is your chin. <laughs> I saw him sign. I didn't say it wasn't down. I never promised you a classy lecture. I didn't sign a contract, Diane, and say I would give one classy lecture. But it does drive home a point. We do tend to respond to what we see. I want to ask you the most powerful question you've ever been asked in your lives. How do you see yourself in your mind? Because I can guarantee you this, the way you see yourself is the way you greet the world, and that is exactly the way the world greets you back. And the risk of being redundant, there's not that much allowance for ignorance. We've got to know what we have inside, and we've got to know how to get it out. Now, there are many ways to reach an end, some are better than others. Does anyone here have uh, a friend or someone who they know that failed kindergarten? Anybody at all? <laughs> it's tough to do, I guess. Anyway, I went to 36th Street Elementary School in Milwaukee. And Mrs. Werfel was my kindergarten teacher. And she uh, was a tall gal, wore long black dresses, and had a hair tucked in a bun in the back. And, and we were sitting around these wooden tables, and we were making paper boxes with this huge jar of white paste that you love to eat. Remember that yeah. kind of a peppermint taste to Anne, you know? Anyway, I was putting more of my tongue than I should on the box, you know? And, and uh, she came around to our table, and she picked up one of the kids' boxes, and she held it high over her head, and she said, children! Children, this is not the way to make a paper box. And she threw it on the table. And the kid was devastated. I mean, you could see he was embarrassed. His face was red as a beet. There were tears welling up in his, in his eyes. And, and you know, he was just really not feeling too good. And as she was holding my box high in the air, <laughs> yeah, it was mine all right, <laughs> Jane. Mine all right. I didn't spend but two weeks in school after that. I got mumps, 
whooping cough, measles, strep throat, pneumonia, anything. So I didn't have to go back to school and feel embarrassed. And I failed kindergarten. I watched all the kids walk on to first grade. And I had to stay there and take that paper box over again. You know, they called me Slow Jim. I talked slowly, I walked slowly, I ate slowly, and I took special reading classes all during elementary school because I was taught that I was a slow reader. I took special reading classes all during high school because I was taught I was a slow reader. Mrs. Ingram in my 12th grade class said something I was very embarrassed about. There were only five people in the room. Polly Jens was one of them. I had a crush on Polly. I never asked her out, never opened my mouth. She was standing back there with Jack Husky and Wally Henderson. I remember it like it was yesterday. Mrs. Ingram said something. I knew she could hear it. And she said, Jim, don't ever attempt college. You'll never make it. Yeah. I don't think they would allow that today. Anyway, they didn't have a word for dyslexia at the time. Uh, but I learned two things from that experience. Number one, never allow anyone's opinion to become more important of you than your own opinion of yourself. And number two, whenever you're self-assured, you don't attract an adverse opinion. Whenever you feel right inside, you don't pull out garbage from other people. And whenever you know who you are, you don't create static in the world around you. You know why? Because it's a law. And there's not that much allowance for ignorance. I said it before, and I'll say it again. We've got to know what we have inside, and we've got to know how to get it out. Many ways to reach an end. Some are better than others. All right. Move on quickly. Another communication tool is speak confidently. Say what you want, not what you don't want. Talk about the solution, not about the problem. Lift the conversation. The way we speak will form the fabric of your future. When you change the things you say about the things you do, you will change your experience. When you change the things you say about those with whom you associate with, you will change your relationship. Words matter. Words are only expressions of how you feel. That's it. Last point. And how are you being accepted? Accept people as they are. That's the key issue. We want to change people, but we're not going to do it. They need to change themselves. It was Robert Frost. I love Robert Frost's work. He said, we love the ones we love for who they are. Not for what we want them to be. Not for what we think they should be. Not for what we know they could be, but for who they are. And the underlying message is often, if only you were more like me, then I'd love you so much more. <laughs> and I'm going to tie this thing together very quickly here. Someday, we may have a, t a chance to get into the cosmic calendar. Of course, we all know there is no time. Everything is the here and now. But this is a fascinating subject, and I do believe it would be fun to talk about it, but not today. <laughs> so who will go to Mars? People who are ready, willing, and able, enthusiastic, eager, eth ethical, respectful, compassionate, curious, can do, trustworthy, Solution seekers, clear thinking and emergency. Do you have any idea who these people are? Uh, Anastasia Stefanova. She's a wonderful gal. Yes, she lives in Moscow. We do have connections in Russia. That's true. And, and, and I do, I do uh, correspond with Anastasia. She's probably going to be, if not the, one of the first women on Mars. I request that you take 60 seconds this week and share within your circle of influence, the idea of forming a self-sustaining human civilization on Mars. And I'd like you to listen to the response. Because if people don't know what's happening, we're not going anywhere. And then what I'd like to ask you to do 
is I'd like to keep a record of that. And if you want to add your voice to creating the new civilization and the new culture in which your children and grandchildren will live, see, us at, see me after the program because uh, Dan and I are forming an entirely new Mars Society chapter where your voice will matter. And remember, there are only three kinds of people, and you know what they are. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and there will always be those who wonder, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> they have no concept. Thank you for your kind attention. It has been my pleasure. <laughs> Diane?